In 2016, the Oscar nomination sparked controversy. Hollywood's most renowned and prestigious awards institution was facing the most important backlash in its history. And all that happened thanks to the help of one hashtag on Twitter, Oscars So White. This hashtag was trying to denounce the lack of diversity in the Academy Awards, which in 2015 and 2016 had only nominated white actors. And following the social media outrage, some of the most important stars in Hollywood decided to boycott the ceremony. But the 2016 Oscar ceremony was only the tip of the iceberg. Protest against the lack of diversity in Hollywood had been ongoing for a century. Black, Latinos, Native Americans, many populations have fought for better representation on the silver screen, and it took Hollywood quite some time to hear their voices. How did it all start? Who came forward to denounce racism in the movie industry? How is this fight still ongoing? This is the story of minority rebellion in Hollywood. In 2016, for the second year in a row, all 20 actors nominated in the lead and supporting acting categories at the Oscars were white. What followed this outrage changed the movie industry forever. But before diving into the Oscars So White scandal, let's see how the ground for such a revolution has been prepared for 100 years by many protesters, and how Hollywood has often reflected the worst habits of its time. These arguments have been a part of that Hollywood story from its very beginning. The Academy Awards history itself embodies this cruel misrepresentation of minorities. Between 1929 and 2016, only 14 black actors have won acting Oscars. The first was Hattie McDaniel for Gone with the Wind in 1940. And the winner's pool is even shallower for other minorities. A mere five Latino actors have won prizes, for example. But minorities have not been silent about it. They didn't wait until 2016 to make their voices heard. The history of racial protest in Hollywood is as old as Hollywood itself. The first blockbuster of cinema history, which also happens to be one of the most groundbreaking movies ever made, was an openly racist movie. When Birth of a Nation came out in 1915, people flocked to it, making it one of the most popular and successful films of its era, or really of any era. And what they were responding to was the fact that this was the first movie that felt and operated like a giant epic book. That's a kind of form that D.W. Griffiths created with Birth of a Nation. Um, he just happened to use that form to tell the story of the birth of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. That itself was extraordinarily controversial at the time as well. So if we look back at it today and say like, I can't believe that this movie came out. I can't believe that millions of people flocked to see it. Well, people were saying the exact same thing a hundred years ago. There were protests, there were fist fights, somebody shot at the screen at one of the screenings of Birth of a Nation. But Birth of a Nation is not the only all-time success that reflects the racism of its time. Another revolutionary movie, the first to include sound, can also be seen as racist by today's standards. The Jazz Singer, released in 1927, signed the death of the silent film era, but it's also a controversial movie. The reason? The main character is seen performing in blackface. It is about a performer who puts on blackface, this very traditional uh, vaudeville technique of painting your face black, giving yourself big white lips to create a very, very stylized racial stereotype, racial caricature of an African-American man, and then sing popular spiritual songs or popular music of the day. And of course, blackface now, we look at it and we say, well, how can you do that? How can you simplify you know, an entire race, an entire person? I wouldn't go so far as to say that The Jazz Singer is a racist movie in the same way that it's not a malicious movie, but it is a product of its time. The movie that invented modern cinema and the first talking movie both contain different levels of racism. But we also have to add to the list the biggest success of all time, still unbeaten by any Marvel movie, Gone with the Wind. Why is this milestone of cinema still adored today, often considered problematic? The only African-American characters that we see in the film are slaves, and sometimes they're treated as racial stereotypes, a little bit shifty, a little bit lazy, uh, tricky, or Hattie McDaniel, you know, she played a maid and she was a 
uh, sort of a southern mommy maid, um, uh, which was it's also its own kind of cliche. And it's a film that depicts a uh, society, you know, the slave uh, slaveholding South, in a very romantic view that completely overlooks the real violence and uh, degradation that was helping support that society. Despite the stereotype she embodied, Hattie McDaniel became the first African American to receive an Academy Award. In 1940, she won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. On the Oscars stage, she declared, I sincerely hope I shall always be a credit to my race and to the motion picture industry. My heart is too full to tell you just how I feel, and may I say thank you and God bless you. But at the time, supporters of the African-American cause frowned upon her historic achievement. When the movie came out, a lot of people uh, in the United States, a lot of African-Americans in the United States, protested it. They were protesting the fact that actress Hattie McDaniel essentially won an Academy Award for playing a racial stereotype, their character of the slave Southern mommy. And when people called her out for perpetrating African-American stereotypes, Hattie McDaniel responded with the following statement, still famous today. I'd rather make $700 a week playing a maid than earn $7 a day being a maid. And so that's all also part of the system. It was a system that gave African-Americans opportunities, but conditional opportunities. Opportunities on the condition that they helped perpetuate the same stereotypes that they were trying to avoid. Protest only intensified through the century, but why did it take so long for Hollywood to hear these voices? Surprisingly, very vocal and organized protests were made against the movie industry as early as the 40s, and the 60s witnessed a movement nearly identical to the Oscars So White movement. Let's rediscover those who paved the way to the changes we are now lucky to witness. But this is a slice of African-American life that people need to, to know about. In the 40s, formal requests were made to obtain better representation on the big screen. In 1942, Walter White, chairman of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, came to Hollywood with a letter in hand. This letter had a very specific goal and had been written by the most powerful woman of the United States at that time. Eleanor Roosevelt, the First Lady, took the time to pen this letter asking for studio executives to receive and listen to what Walter White had to say. And what he had to complain about was the lack of proper roles for the African-American community. That's a sign already that not only were people agitating for change uh, in 1942, but some of the people agitating for change were doing so from the highest levels of American culture. This was a letter from the White House that the man had. He came to Hollywood hoping to convince studio heads to get rid of their stereotypical characters and let those performers show the full extent of their humanity. But his task would prove to be a difficult one. When he spoke with some of the studio chiefs, they listened to what he had to say, but they didn't really take his advice to heart. In fact, they were actually happier to meet him halfway. Instead of creating new uh, textured, um, fully written roles for African-American performers. They just got rid of African-Americans from the screen altogether. This failed attempt led naturally to more angry forms of contestation. As early as 1962, the Oscar ceremony had been picketed in the interest of equal opportunity for African-Americans. Tired of the negotiations, a group called the Hollywood Race Relations Bureau took direct action and paraded in front of the Oscar ceremonies with signs urging film equality for Negroes and and the protest unfortunately ended at the police station. The protest led to 12 arrests. Why were these people arrested? Of course, protesting is a civil right. Protesting, everybody has the right to protest because 12 of them their toes dipped onto the red carpet. And so, of course, the streets themselves are open to the public, but the red carpet that evening was part of a private event. And so 12 people were arrested for trespassing uh, at the 1962 Oscars just because they somehow made their way onto the red carpet. In the end, I don't think that those 12 people spent a long time in jail. I don't think that uh, those charges lasted, but here we are more than 50 years later talking about their protest. And so at least their protest might have had some greater effect. And the African-American community wasn't the only one thinking Hollywood was being retrograde in its portrayal of minorities. Latino and Hispanic characters were often depicted as quite untrustworthy, criminal, um, and, and sometimes lazy. Uh, one of the first 
big actions in the 1950s and 1960s uh, for Latino activists was getting rid of a certain television mascot called the Frito Bandito. Latino activists said, well, why does it have to be the Frito Bandito? Why can't it be the Frito Amigo? Why can't it be somebody who comes and shares his potato chips instead of this little rascal who comes and steals the potato chips? And so that's really indicative of just where the culture was with the stereotypes that it associated with Hispanic and Latino men for the most part. Latinos took a stand in the 70s through the organization Justicia. It was trying to create leverage, trying to use the tools of the court, the, the tools of business to create a window for themselves to make their case. And in fact, it did work. But one of the biggest scandals of the Oscars history was yet to come. Another population was being strongly misrepresented, Native Americans. They had been portrayed by white actors in many Westerns and depicted as violent savages in a countless amount of movies. And it took the support of one of the greatest actors of all time to help them make their voices heard at the Oscars. It's 1973. Marlon Brando just played his most iconic role in The Godfather. Following the movie's success, he was sure to win the Oscar. And he decided to take advantage of his moment of glory to make a provocative move, still bold by today's criteria. So his idea was that, well, I can have a larger presence with my absence. If I send somebody else in my stead, I can make a larger impact, make a larger statement. So he sent a Native American actress named Sasheen Littlefeather to collect the Oscar for him and to read a 15-page statement condemning Hollywood for their treatment of Native Americans on screen and showing his support for Native Americans at Wounded Knee, which uh, was an ongoing political story, an ongoing siege between Native American activists and the American government. When she went on stage to collect the Oscars and denounce the treatment of Native Americans on screen, she was booed by many in the audience. And Clint Eastwood, who appeared on stage shortly after, mocked her speech. I don't know if I should present this award on behalf of all the cowboys shot on all the John Ford Westerns over the years. The lines are kind of muddied, but in the end, the statement that he was trying to make got lost in the larger controversy. All these protests slowly made room for change, but still very slow change. Nevertheless, black actors at the Oscars would soon make history. <laughs> we'll see what happens. In 1964, Sidney Poitier won the Academy Award for Best Actor for the movie Lilies of the Field. He was the first African American to do so. This accomplishment is even more impressive if you remember that two years before, in 1962, black protesters were arrested on the red carpet. His victory can't be undermined, and it meant a lot for the African American community. But Sidney Poitier was still, at the time, the exception that proved the rule. It didn't necessarily change the larger industry and how many African Americans were given the opportunities to lead movies, to have movie star roles. People thought that the market wasn't able to support that. Why did people think the market wasn't able to support that? Because nobody was making it and so nobody had proven that the market was able to support that. And so it's all tied in. It's like the snake eating its own tail. And it took many years to see another black actor win that award again. In the meantime, Denzel Washington won for Best Supporting Actor in 1989 for Glory, and Cuba Gooding Jr. won Best Supporting Actor in 1996 for Jerry Maguire. Talented black actors were still only supporting roles in movies led by white actors. It was only in 2002, 30 years after Poitier, that something major took place. Really, the breakthrough uh, award was in 2002, when both Halle Berry won the Best Actress Oscar, for Monsters Ball, becoming the first African-American actress to win Best Actress. And Denzel Washington won his second acting award. He won Best Actor for Training Day. In Monsters Ball, Halle Berry played a grieving woman whose husband was executed on death row. And in Training Day, Denzel Washington played a larger-than-life evil cop. They're bad people in all lines of work. You know, it's a bad person. He's a twisted person who has a license to kill. So these are the kind of roles that win movie stars Oscars, not because they showed themselves to be more dignified, not because they played a supporting role in a film that was ultimately a white man's story. These are two films anchored by African-American actors giving 
big movie star performances. And that really is the breakthrough. Following this milestone, a few black actors had won the Oscar for Best Actor. Jamie Foxx for Ray in 2004, and Forrest Whitaker in 2006 for The Last King of Scotland. But these wins don't feel as revolutionary as the 2002 Oscars. Why so? It doesn't have the same shock as giving two African Americans Best Actor and Best Actress, not because they imitated a very well-known historical figure, not because they played in a film with some larger social import, just because they chewed scenery and they created memorable turns as movie stars, regardless of everything else about the film. In the 2000s, Oscars were opening their doors to more diversity, black actors were being nominated every year. But in 2015, the Oscars made two steps back and planted the seed for an unprecedented controversy. Let's see what happened. On one morning in 2015, the journalist April Rain was watching the announcement of the Academy Awards nominations. When she noticed that all 20 acting nominations went to white actors, she decided to tweet a joke. Hashtag Oscars so white, they asked to touch my hair. It was the first time in nearly a decade that no black actors were nominated for an Academy Award. And that just sort of took off. That hashtag took off and people started making, you know, jokes, using that hashtag for jokes on Twitter. And it lasted for an entire year. But the hashtag was then only a joke on social media. It took the announcement of the Oscar nominations in 2016 to make it an industry-wide movement. For the second year in a row, no black actors were to be found in the best actors categories. The outrage spread all over America. It created a kind of meltdown in a way, didn't it? People were very vocal with their disappointment. People were very vocal with their anger. Uh, it was no longer just a hashtag. It was a real problem that people both in the industry and outside of the industry wanted to be solved. The domino effect started with director Spike Lee announcing he would not attend the ceremony. He denounced the fact that the movie Selma, depicting the fight of Martin Luther King, only had a single nomination. What I've been saying since 1988, school days, wake up. His criticism was heard and shared by actress Jada Pinkett Smith. She decided to tweet the word boycott and even referred to Sasheen Littlefeather as an influence. Interesting to see how these events are not isolated, how Sasheen Littlefeather's protest on behalf of Marlon Brando helps inspire Jada Pinkett 40 years later, when in fact, we're still dealing with some of the same problems. Her husband, Will Smith, also called to boycott the ceremony. He was personally upset he wasn't nominated for Best Actor for his movie, Concussion. The ceremony aired under high scrutiny. The irony was that the host of the 2016 Oscar ceremony was a black actor, Chris Rock. He refused to boycott and instead used his time on stage to address the issue. I'm here at the Academy Awards, otherwise known as the White People's Choice Awards. If they nominated hosts, I would never have gotten this job. We want black actors to get the same opportunities, not just once. Leo gets a great part every year. What about Jamie Foxx? And all that protest under the Oscar So White banner proved to be very effective. The president of the Academy is Cheryl Boone Isaacs, and she is an African-American woman. She realizes that they can't say, well, we have to have a mandatory number of nominations for actors of color every single year. And so to make that change, the Oscars made a clever decision by, in both 2016 and 2017, expanding radically the voter base of the Academy Awards. They brought in more international actors and directors, more people of color, and younger voters as well. And things changed indeed. The 2017 Oscars were much more diverse than they had ever been. Viola Davis and Mahershala Ali both won for Best Supporting Actors and Moonlight, directed by Barry Jenkins, won Best Pictures. But some called for caution. Viola Davis, her Oscar in hand, was skeptical about whether the hashtag Oscar So White campaign has had a real, lasting impact on the Academy Awards. I believe what still is a deficiency is that we have one year a plethora of African-American movies and then the next year, nothing. But some also believed it was a mistake to focus only on the Oscars when the issue was much larger than the ceremony. And what Davis and many other people have argued is the problem isn't the lack of talent, the problem is the lack of opportunity. How do you change the lack of opportunity? Well, you have to change the people that are making the decisions behind the scenes. The few years that followed saw many other battles and some of Hollywood's most shameful habits were slammed and exposed in the media. 
Once again, it took social media to increase scrutiny around one of Hollywood's oldest twisted traditions, whitewashing. What is it? It's the casting of white actors as non-white characters, depriving non-white actors of these roles. Well, originally it was just a question of pragmatism. You know, studios would have these giant back lots where they would film seven, eight, nine different films every single day <laughs> at a time. And they had people that were salaried. So the extras on a film would be Roman soldiers one day, Indians the next day, uh, and Greek gods the day after. With society's evolution, this habit has progressed and seen as retrograde and insulting toward minorities. Part of that is the fact that there are generations and generations of people who grew up watching Mickey Rooney, for instance, doing a very crude Asian caricature in Breakfast at Tiffany's, or Peter Sellers doing a somewhat crude uh, Indian caricature in the party, and they were made fun of. But even in the 2010s, many big studio movies had been accused of whitewashing. It was the case in 2013 with The Lone Ranger, in which Johnny Depp played the Comanche Tonto. Aloha, in 2015, casted Emma Stone as someone of half Hawaiian, half Chinese descent. She has since apologized, saying, There's a lot of conversation about how we want to see people represented on screen, and what we need to change as a business to reflect culture in a clearer way, and not in an idealized way. There are some flaws in the system. My eyes have been opened in many ways this year. It's not Moses. This is not his family. Another good example is the movie Exodus, Gods and Kings. The movie tells the biblical story of Moses, and as usual, the part was given to a white actor, Christian Bale this time, just like it happened in the 50s with Charlton Heston. Director Ridley Scott said about his casting, I can't mount a film of this budget and say that my lead actor is Mohammed so-and-so from such and such. I'm just not going to get it financed. So the question doesn't even come up. Scarlett Johansson for her 2017 movie, Ghost in the Shell. I feel I grew a lot when I made making this film. I learned a lot about my, um, my limitations. According to many, this adaptation of a Japanese animated movie shouldn't have casted a white actress as the lead. The argument that the studio would say was that, well, there's no Asian American actress who has the same international profile and box office appeal as Scarlett Johansson, and so, we have to go with the pragmatic business choice. The people responding to the studio would say, well, yeah, there is no Asian movie star in the age bracket of Scarlett Johansson because you're not giving any Asian American actresses the opportunities to prove themselves as box office action stars. So it's a real chicken or egg thing. Can you put an unknown into a role that you need a movie star for? But these endless protests are forcing Hollywood to change, even if Hollywood will never completely abandon its main goal of obtaining while taking as little as possible. Studios do not lead the way, studios follow. If they were making Exodus, God and Kings today, I don't think they would cast Christian Bale. I think they would cast Rami Malek. Not because the studio is any more progressive, it's just that, well, Rami Malek is a very popular Egyptian-American actor who won an Academy Award and started in a massive film. Nevertheless, progress is here and managed to make its way in Hollywood's quest for success. Progress even proved to be profitable. In 2018 and 2019, two Mexican directors won at the Oscars for movies promoting inclusion. Guillermo del Toro in 2018 for The Shape of Water and Alfonso 2019 for Roma. Spike Lee even won his first Oscar for Best Screenplay in 2019 for his very political film, Black Klansman. But being praised by critics is not enough, and a movie like Get Out, released in 2017, proved a horror film with an unknown black lead actor could both be a smash hit at the box office and politically relevant. I hope that they have a discussion about race or horror films uh, that they haven't had before. But the movie that became a true milestone for African-American cinema is the Marvel-produced Black Panther. This movie, casting a large majority of black actors, became one of the biggest successes of all time. You know, when I was a kid, I could see Superman, you know, maybe Batman a little bit later or whatnot. But to see someone who looks like you occupying that role of being larger than life, 
you know, and there is entertainment, but when you get a chance to see a reflection of yourself on the screen as well, there is empowerment. We have here a Marvel Universe that is unapologetically black. And to see us occupy an African country with kings and queens and warriors, and it's so inspiring. It's an aspirational nation. And a new generation of black actors bloomed within a few years. Michael B. Jordan in Creed and Black Panther, John Boyega in the new Star Wars trilogy, Lupita Nyong'o in Us, Daniel Kaluuya in Get Out. The list goes on and on. But that's a question of audacity. Somebody has to take the risk at some point to say, you know what, we're going to take a bet on a new generation of talent that can be more diverse, play wider roles. We can measure the distance minorities have come from Birth of a Nation to Black Panther. It has been a century of struggles, each decade bringing new hopes and letdowns. But the new Hollywood seems to have understood inclusion is not a risk after all. It's the best way to keep shining.